the Jeannie Roll Show. Today is Friday, September 6th, 2019. Hi, Eric. Hey, Julie. So glad it's Friday. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's been a busy week for both of us. Wow. But yeah. we made it through, almost finished with our Friday workday. It is um, almost 3.30 p.m. here in Central USA. And so I have a few more sessions this afternoon. It's been a productive day. And I'm just thankful, Eric, to you for taking time to do another podcast recording. I'm thankful so. to you, too. It's a pleasure, as always. Thanks. So, <sighs> this podcast we've talked about for several months. We just released the one this morning that we recorded yesterday on um, homesickness. And today we're going to talk about some more sacred bloodlines, or bloodlines in general, but specifically sacred bloodlines and royal bloodlines, and tie that in with some of the patterns that Eric and I have um, been talking about that we've learned about either through the spirit or through some historical records, and the really kind of combination. Mm -hmm. So, we haven't really even decided what we're titling this, um, but we'll come up with, we always come up with a title pretty much after we do the podcast, so we'll see what comes up. Yeah. Um, Eric, I want to turn it over to you right away because you've been studying several records, and um, I'd like you maybe to kind of explain a little bit of maybe how this came about and what what you see is important for us to talk about today. Okay, that sounds good. Boy, I don't really know how to start other, like, you know, as we just research things and feel things and we have our conversations and stuff that's turned into this but it's also you can't deny the role of the spirit in it right like a lot of the times the spirit just puts something in your mind and you're like yeah i'm gonna go research that where last week i had no interest in it right and so so you can't dismiss the spirit's role in triggering certain thoughts and ideas and um what's interesting to me julie is as we've talked over the last couple of years We've had all these little pockets of research and interests, and they all seemed disconnected two years ago to me. And with bloodlines, this idea, it's kind of like it's that tapestry you keep talking about. They're all connected. It's all one big story, you know? And right. and so I, I hope that this idea of bloodlines can kind of be that common thread in a lot of the topics that we've, if not all the topics we've discussed. The I have some notes right here. Um, I think a good place to start on the topic of bloodlines is the scriptural accounts of, of Jacob chapter 5. It's the allegory of the olive tree. It's one of the most, I think, overlooked scriptures it's long and it's repetitive and i mean it's like 70 or 80 verses right but anyway i think it's beautiful and it's it was a simple allegory or a metaphor that prophets of old the prophet zenic and other prophets have quoted or seem to have borrowed concepts from the allegory of the olive tree but it um of course back then horticulture and viticulture and all kinds of cult horticulturist thingies were were the thing of the day and so it was a it was a good way to tie to make some abstract concept really like resonate in people's ears and so I love the allegory but um, in short there's an olive tree it's old it represents the house of Israel um, the tree is dying this this would be right about Isaiah's time period the tree is dying um, they the, the masters of the vineyard wanted to preserve the tree, so the way to do that in horticulture is to cut some branches off, plant them in other young trees, let them grow, and then it gives the, the roots a chance to catch up with the branches and the fruit. And it's a way to make the tree healthy and vibrant again. Um, and, and so I'm going to actually read part of this. Let's see, it says, And behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. And it mattereth not that if it so be that the root of this tree will perish, I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. Okay, so there's the Lord saying, I'm going to cut these branches off. I'm going to plant them all over the vineyard in whatever tree I want, in whatever location I want. 
the interpretation of that is I'm going to take the Israelites, the Jews, the Israelites in Jerusalem. They're wicked, and I'm going to plant them all over the world. I'm going to plant some in the Philippines, some in Asia, some in America, which the world mostly didn't even know about at that time. Plant them in the Isles of the Sea. And so that's what he did. We know, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we know that the Lord did this simply from the, Rec the Book of Mormon. But... What I've come to see is that there, and, and we, we know doctrinally and scripturally, because the Book of Mormon says there are other parts of the vineyard. There are, um, when the Savior came to the Americas, he said, there are other sheep I have that are not of this fold, and that's the lost tribes of Israel. And them I also must bring, right? They'll hear my voice. So, this is all worth mentioning because there are a lot of bloodlines, um, scattered across the world that tie back into that mother tree, that olive tree. And we've found some records and traditions. And interestingly, Julie, I, I find it interesting, don't you, that every time I look these things up on Wikipedia or, um, you know, just the internet, it almost always starts out with this mythological or this legendary right. or this folklore, you know. Right. It's, it's yeah, always... Yeah, find out. But wait a second, there's a lot of truth in here mixed with lies that the Luciferians and others have told. But, um, wow, there's some truth to be found. Right. You can't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> the occult has their hands on everything. But yeah, it, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's well said. I just realized I can switch back and forth. So when I'm talking, I'm going to try this different view here. But, um, So it's interesting, like Julie says, the occult has painted a lot of these really key moments in history, these key cultures, these key bloodlines, and have painted them as fictitious, mythological. Um, okay. One of the most pivotal times in history in terms of bloodlines was the time of King Zedekiah. And LDS people will know this as the time of Lehi and Nephi. And this is more significant than I think we've been led to believe, at least those who haven't researched it. It's it really is a pivotal time in history. So let me just kind of paint the, the background. This was this was a hundred years after Isaiah. Um, Isaiah by this time and, and many other prophets had prophesied of the destruction of um, Jerusalem, of the scattering. And um, things are heating up politically between Jerusalem and Babylon and other countries, Samaria, I think. And um, I think it's also worth mentioning right here that in ancient Israelite government, there were three types of leadership. There was the civic leadership, who was the king. There was the priest, or the high priest, who governed all things related to temple worship and rites and rituals. Um, who at the time was Hilkiah. And then you have a third governing body, which is the prophets. And a lot of times we hear about this in the scriptures as the, the prophets or the teachers or the warners. It's a loose category of those people. And um, if we were to apply those same sit settings of in ancient Israelite times to today, Julie, I would wholeheartedly put you in that third rank of prophets. And back then, it wouldn't have been uncomfortable to people at all to hear of a woman or, or several people, even young children, in this group of prophets. It's uncomfortable today for some reason. It's just been lost in our culture. But back to, back to the subject here. Among that group of prophets were a lot of familiar names. Jeremiah was one. Lehi, we know through the Book of Mormon. Huldah was a female prophetess at that same time. Ezekiel, right about the same time, um, and later on, a, an up-and-coming prophet, Daniel, who, who was really a prophet over in Babylon after the um, captivity. Zedekiah was a righteous, or, or well, he wasn't, he wasn't righteous. What I meant to say was he was the, there, there was a lot of politics surrounding why he was even king. His brother was king, um, his brother was killed by Nebuchadnezzar. They had another brother that replaced him, and he was killed, or 
shut down or something. I can't remember the full story there. By a king of lot of, lot of um, corruption in that family line, right? Which yeah. leads into some of the other topic about bloodlines that we're going to talk about. Good, yeah. good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, and and so because of all the co- corruption or whatever took place there, Zedekiah ends up. Strife. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I and, don't know. If you kill your brother or your uncle or your dad, there might be some deep issues <laughs> that need to be resolved. There might be. Just yeah. just saying, right? <laughs> well, Zedekiah was appointed by King Bab- the king of Babylon um, to rule, kind of temp- uh, well, to rule. And what happens? Something goes wrong politically, and... Um, Jeremiah's consulted, Huldah's consulted, the Zedekiah didn't really listen very well, and he was taken in, he's carried away into Babylon with his family. Two of his sons were killed, executed publicly, um, and Zedekiah's eyes were put out. Julie, do you have anything you want to add to that story? I know you know more. Um, I know that those who served as prophets during that day that had gifts uh, did try to warn Zedekiah. And quite frank, frankly, he said he didn't listen well. He, he didn't listen. Uh, he let his ego and pride get in the way, and it led to devastation for a kingdom. Um, there are details there that, that I've been shown and have seen that I, I don't feel to go into other than to say that um, some of the family members, the women, were raped repeatedly. People were sodomized. Some were made eunuchs. Uh, watching certain family members, like you said, be executed. Um, it was it was horrific what this family went through and what many of those that were in that kingdom went through as a result of the choices that some of those individuals made. Um, My heart goes out to them, even still. (laughs) Sorry, I just got a phone call. (laughs) We don't know how to... We're not going to cut the video, so you guys just saw me send a sorry I can't talk right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is to let everybody know we don't cut the video. This is we real are and not raw, gonna, baby. This is, this is not uh, us trying to be high end videographers. <laughs> That's not the purpose of these videos. We don't care about lighting and special effects. So um, when when Eric and I and a few other individuals. Um, we're beginning to talk about this several months ago. We did a session, and um, it was so emotional for me what we were clearing at that time on some of the visuals that I had. Um, Eric will attest that I was literally sobbing my eyes out uncontrollably almost and had to take a break. It went on for several minutes. Um, I was extremely emotional on behalf of uh, memories that I have um, from my book of life and because of the emotions I felt and still feel from those who are part of this royal bloodline and those that um, came to earth to also help, if you will, clean up the bloodline. Uh, What I see often is there's like a three-strand DNA that... uh, was entered into at the time of Lucifer and the fall and um, when we uh, left the garden, essentially, those those that um, are um, offspring of Adam and Eve and others. And so you go to, from a, like a higher vibration to simply put a, a three-strand DNA And the longer they're on the earth, the kind of the darker their energy gets in a celestial state with adversarial influence. 
And by the time different parts of history have happened, the Lord will then send someone of the light that has a higher spiritual vibration understanding to condescend and to bring light into that bloodline. And it helps to clean it up a bit, helps to, uh, for lack of a better word, help the species to survive. What we had with Noah and the Ark was that the earth had gotten wicked enough and uh, the giants and mixing of races and Luciferians and the whole yucky yucky, the planet needed to be cleansed and cleaned up and washed. Um, and uh, we're getting ready for that again, <laughs> as many of you know. And so with the time of Zedekiah, there was, there was great atrocity like many other times on the history of the earth. But the Lord in his goodness and wisdom and foresight millennia ago uh, planned for that and for the rescue of his children and for the rescue of the sacred bloodline even those who needed to come forth in the last days those that would set the stage leading up to other other amazing works and other miracles so Eric um, can you kind of talk about Tamar and well there's another name for her I remember her as Tamar. Um, I have um, Tia, T-I-A, Tia was a nickname, Tamar, Tamra. There's a few different names that she was known by. Um, can you talk about that and what, yeah. what happened there? Yeah, thanks for everything you said. That was the next thing I was going to mention, actually. So um, so I mentioned Zedekiah and his wife. They had uh, several children. Two of the men were executed. I imagine they were high-ranking princes or something, and um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was making a political statement there. Three of the children were preserved. We know about one of these through the Book of Mormon, um, and that's Mulek. And we read about that in Mosiah chapter 25, verse 2, and in Helaman chapter 6, verse 10, we read about the Mulekites and how Mulek was one of the sons of Zedekiah that escaped. Now, I, in asking and thinking about this, I don't know if this is right. This is my feeling. I feel like the Spirit's been whispering this to me, that Mulek would have been a younger son. He would have been sort of perhaps the odd one in the family, maybe the prepper type of person who he followed the Spirit. He was probably righteous and spiritual. And I feel like he he knew what was coming. He probably knew Nephi and, um, and Jeremiah and got word that people were leaving and he got out. He, he got, and, and so we learn he built a, I don't know if he built a boat, but the point is he came across the ocean to America. So he was preserved. So here we have Royal blood, Davidic, Royal Israelite bloodline off in America. I think that's very significant. There's two others, two, and these are both girls. We read about Tamar, she, like, and Julie mentioned some of her other names. Tia Tepe is one of her other names. She, there are records that indicate that Jeremiah was actually her, uh, her grandpa, no, her great grandpa, I think. And so he, he being a prophet would have had forewarning and would have known the scriptures and prophecies of Isaiah that this was coming. And so he, takes this princess and her younger princess daughter uh, sister which I don't have a name for takes them it at this point it seems to be um, a pattern that the Lord always has a place of safety for his covenant people a land a geographic place and in this case it was Britain no question it, just like we think of America was one of the safe places which it was um, Britain was a safe place to Israelites for, for hundreds of years. And so Jeremiah takes these two princesses and goes west. Um, and I have sources on this. By the way, I'm going to put all this on my blog so you can follow notes and sources. But um, I'm just I just need to catch up in my notes and see where we are. The younger princess, as they're migrating west, they reach this land of the Zarahites and um, they're entreated by the royal blood there. And, and the Zarahites, if you were to look at it today, is basically the area or the land of Spain. So what happens then is this younger daughter, princess, 
marries into this to this Zerahi royal blood, and then thus infusing that same Davidic royal bloodline into the Spain area, Spain Portugal area. Jeremiah and um, Tamar continue westward to Britain, and there the same sort of things ha thing happens. There's um, there's a king of Britain named. Let's see, do I have this right? It's Olam Fodla, and he gave consent. Oh, sorry, King Eokide. Eokide. I don't even know how to pronounce it. The head king gives his consent to Tamar Tepi to be the queen consort of Ireland. Um, there's also a tradition that Jeremiah and Tamar took the Stone of Destiny, which is used in coronations in um, in England to this day, and that's the tradition of how that stone got there. It's on that chair, right, that the royalty is coronated on, and all that history, which is which is believed to be the pillow of Jacob in that special experience in the Old Testament where Jacob um, saw had a vision of the ladder ascending to heaven. Julie, do you want to chime well, in? Would, yep. I want to inject there. The question is, why would this king, who is queer over in England, grant this uh, coronation, grant Ireland for her to become a queen? What did he know that has not been revealed yet or has not been exposed because maybe... Uh, it, it was recorded and someone has either burned the records or stolen the records and is hiding them up somewhere. Say, uh, I don't know, like the Vatican. And um, <laughs> there, are, there are definite insights as to how some of these records would have made it over from the Israelites in the time of Jeremiah over to Britain, bridging the gap there. You don't just make a foreigner a queen. That doesn't just happen. He had it had substantial um, information, at the very least in a physical realm, but probably in a spiritual realm, uh, which you know we don't have access to. But what I am seeing is that he, they presented these gifts, if you will, these relics, these um, well, relics is the best the, the English word that I can come up with. But basically, like you said, the stone and some other things where they were able to give evidence or, quote, proof of their royal lineage. And this king, knowing the history, having come, you know, those ancestors in England, having come from the East previously, would have known through his own history that at some point in time, these um, connections would be made, and perhaps maybe the Spirit even moved upon him that this was to be done. Um, and so I, I find it just fascinating, right? Like, if you, if you start asking these questions of, like, well, why didn't he grant that to another woman in the kingdom? And what did he see in her? Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? That um, that is is not yet available to us. So, um, and, and why was it important that she be um, coordinated as a queen? What's that even mean? Why does anybody on this planet ever care about coronations or kings or queens or... Um, any of this stuff like why why was this even a part of the history of the earth you know yeah. there are always much higher purposes between the physical realm and what we do here compared to what goes on the heavens there are similar patterns so in the heavens we have kings and queens and we have that on the light side and the dark side and what's manifested on earth now for instance in england are quote unquote royal bloodlines that have been corrupted and we see that throughout history in every country of dark bloodlines dark packs with the devil satanic satanic packs and things like that and and yet there's the righteous bloodline of say king david and the davidic line with the savior and these spiritual bloodlines or spiritual kingdoms if you will that have been brought or manifested on earth, either for the light or for the dark. That's going to maybe blow some minds. They've never thought of it like that. So there are patterns that I see in the heavens with sacred geometry, with creation, with literally worlds without number. And part of what I have been charged with is to come here 
as a warning voice and as a witness um, to witness and testify of truths, doctrinal truths, creation truths, sacred um, sacred patterns, and um, and to help open your hearts and minds that there is so much more going on in the universe than what meets the eye and with what you can see in the three-dimensional or even what scientists now call a five-dimensional sphere. This is not five dimensions, you guys. These are hundreds of dimensions um, within and around us. And so as individuals on both sides of the veil are listening to this, it's shifting the energy in the universe as people wake up to their divine potential, to their knightship or their kingship or their queenship. Whether they are a king or a queen or a priest or priestess or whatever, you know, wherever they are in their eternal progression. And, and it was no different back then than it is now, other than in some ways there was truth on the planet then that we do not now have. Now, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have the restoration of the fullness of the gospel, which implies that at some point in time, the fullness was on the earth. And we have not yet seen the full restoration of all things. And we have a lot of cultural things that have been passed down that are, frankly, false beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I love the Book of Mormon. And it truly is the most correct book on the planet. But there are still false beliefs and false teachings that have been passed down because the people that wrote it and abridged it were imperfect people. And it's still more clear and clean than the Bible. But I see, quite frankly, a lot of members of the church who neglect to read their Bible and to study records that if they did, they would have more of a complete picture of what's really going on on this earth. And we're not supposed to read the Book of Mormon at the neglect of the Bible, and quite frankly, I see a lot of people doing that. Yeah, you're right. So, um, anyway, so, so these bloodlines, right? We have these higher purposes in the House of Israel. The House of Israel is not the only... The only per- important um, group of people on the planet, right? There are specific roles or jobs or covenants that we've made, and we've been born into these lineages or households or bloodlines for specific purposes based on our choices and the choices of others and our agency and based on what we are hoping for in eternal progression. And without going into all of that, I did. I do know Eric and I talked about this right before the podcast started. We do plan on doing more podcasts. I don't know how many, at least a couple more, maybe dozens more. I don't know on sacred bloodlines, on royal lineage, on the history of the world, because there have been so many lies told, and there's so many revisionist history. But from the very beginning, with Cain, they started doing revision, right. revisionist history. Right? right. Even before Cain came, um, you know the records that were kept. A lot of lies, and so where we can help expose some of that and help people clear clear their energy so that they can understand that there's more truth to be found, it will help resonate with your spirit and give you greater hope and let you know that even though you don't remember who you are, the Luciferians do, and you are far greater and have far more potential than you have any idea. And so if you're getting uh, mobbed by the adversary and having a lot of opposition, well, that's your first clue that they know who you are and they're trying to stop you. Um, and and that goes back to the, the bloodlines in Jeremiah's day, right? I mean, why the opposition in that family line? What, what did those Luciferians back then, because they existed then, know that know about those people that we don't know now about the sacred patterns about multiple probations about creation about how one does or doesn't become a god or goddess for the light or the dark right so we look at these patterns is there any more you want to say on that time period eric yeah there's more you can wrap up what you're where you are and i'll just continue so well the important part that I want to, and we'll, we'll connect this later on with the other sacred bloodlines we talked about with Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene going into England years later after Christ was crucified. Um, this bloodline that came over from the day of, of Jeremiah that went into England was already in existence, right? And so then they connect up. So then you have to ask the question, why was Mary Magdalene's daughter then eligible 
eligible to marry into another royal family, right? right? And that has been covered in history, too. Christ and Mary Magdalene were married. They had four children, two boys and two girls. One died at the age of seven, a girl, in, and was buried in Jerusalem. And the other three came over into Europe. One stayed in England, a son. He died at about the age of 26. The other one came in, and, and one of the daughters came over into England and some other places, and she married into the royal lineage, which carried on, again, a different line, if you will, of Israelite blood, and again, bringing it full circle with that similar pattern or same pattern in a circular fashion. And I see this energy in circles, and and everybody has these circles around them in their energy bodies, and even the chakras, and those intersect and they connect. And I'm um, going to start getting into really deep doctrines and <laughs> sacred geometries that people aren't ready for. Why, so you ask the question, why would Christ's daughter be hidden, rescued, left to die on a boat, but rescued by the Lord and taken into Europe, and then married in to royal family lines? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how in the world did that happen? And how come we don't hear about it? How come we don't know about it? And who burned those records or stole those records or hid those records? And for what purpose? Well, the adversary did it, but the Lord knew they would. And it's actually been for your protection and mine, those of us that are the remnant, those of us that are from the Davidic line or from that sacred bloodline of Christ, whether you're a direct descendant of the Davidic line or not, or just part of that sacred bloodline and adopted into the house of Israel, it is the same. We have been protected and hidden until the time is to come forth to be acknowledged and to rise and to stand up and to, to do what we, we covenanted to do primordially. Oh. Had a lot in there. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> These podcasts are for me. <laughs> okay, so let's let's go ahead. I'm going to say fast forward to Joseph of, of, um, of Egypt and Asenath, but really that's going backwards in time before Jeremiah. But I, let's bring it kind of come around and talk a little bit about Joseph of Egypt and Asenath. Asenath ended up marrying Joseph. Um, do, you want, do you have anything you want to say about that? No, no you. Keep going here. I don't have any notes on this. Okay. This is your gig. Okay. So, Joseph of Egypt, um, which I don't have permission from the Spirit to, to tell you who he was in um, later, later probations, but he is not on the planet. He does serve as um, a head general on the other side of the veil. Joseph of Egypt is highly skilled, as you can imagine, in Egyptian culture, tied into the pyramids, the pharaohs, and ascension, and there are some really deep doctrines tied into what the Egyptians knew and how they worshipped, and some of the corruption then, as well as the true religion or the true knowledge that they had regarding ascension. If you look at the pyramids, just say the pyramids. Why do you think the Illuminati have stolen, and the Masons, which are tied together, have stolen the eye for the all-seeing eye and the pyramids? They've turned it into a dark symbol, which, which in fact... It is not, and it was not. They've just absconded it. So so go and, and study some of that stuff about Joseph of Egypt wherever you can. There's a lot of false records um, or things being said about... Something's beeping. Sorry. My battery's dying, and I have to turn my car on to charge it. This is real and raw. Sorry, as you were. <laughs> okay. And so Joseph of Egypt, and what did he know? And how did he, which, which again, being the son of Rachel and Jacob and having the gifts that he had and the, the tragedy of what his brothers did to him and putting him in the pit and selling him into Egypt as a slave. And look how he rose and he fulfilled his mission. And had that not happened with the, the awful things that the adversary um, caused in his life, allowed him to push forward, to move forward, to fulfill his mission for a greater purpose that is still yet to be completely fulfilled. And I mean that when I say that, because that individual, with what the Lord has planned for him in coming creations, will one day re be revealed to some of you, and he is absolutely magnificent. And even what he learned in Egypt was in preparation for his divine potential of, of great things in the future. And um, I just am so thankful for the records we do have that are true, and um, one day, the lies that have been told about him or told about Christ or 
article about Mary Magdalene or any of anybody will be corrected. And, um, and so in the meantime, I look at the sacred patterns there. I look at the relationship. Now, Zenith, she had been, for those that don't know, she had been adopted um, into, for lack of a better word, like a, an idolatrous household. Um, she was the, her parents were, were um, Esau, E-S-A-U, Esau, right, Esau, of, I'm drawing a blank, Isaac and Esau, no, Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Esau, those were his, Esau was her dad, although she was the product of rape, so here is a woman who was conceived in rape, then adopted out into an idolatrous family in Egypt, and when she met Joseph of Egypt, um, who was a Hebrew and the son of Rachel and Jacob of the Israelites, um, which is where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. He was one of the 12 sons. So she meets him at the age of 18, and she's heard that he was a Hebrew and that he had done inappropriate things. She'd heard the stories and the rumors about what he had supposedly done to um, Potiphar's wife, which were all lies. And then she repents, and she has this whole long story. For those of you who don't know, there are some records. I don't even know how to get them. Somebody sent them to me. But it's the Joseph and Asenath records. Um, do, do you know how to get those even? I mean, not not really. I'm sure just a yeah. Google search, you know. Yeah, Google search it. Joseph and Asenath. Um, and there's a fascinating story with her transformation, her repentance, her... Um, it doesn't ever say that she converted to Judaism, but he, Joseph did marry her. And then they ended up having some children, and they ended up ruling all of Egypt. Um, it's an amazing story. Again, in preparation for her in future probations and for him. And the patterns are similar where um, then we can go and fast forward to another significant time period with lots of lies that have been told. This, these are all things from my book of life. Uh, that is where I got this information. I've, I've had other people send me documents that have confirmed what I remember, what I see, what I hear. And so uh, for years, this has been my understanding. I had no proof, if you will, until the last several months. King Arthur. That's another one. Lots and lots of lies told. But that ties into English royal bloodline, too. Eric, do you want to take over from here and talk a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. I'd like to read a, a scripture. I always like to bring these in when they apply. There's one in Jeremiah. Um, it says, it's Jeremiah 15, 11. It says, It shall be well with thy remnant. Verily, I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. Um, Isaiah has the prophecy that kings and queens shall be thy nursing fathers and mothers. I just I'm trying to tie in this idea that Israel will always be cared for and and there's even this idea that will always be in royal positions and I'll, I'll answer your question in a second Julie but I also wanted to tie in the British royal crest if if you if people just go out and look at that look at the icons on there there are so many symbols of Israel on it there are arrows there's the lion which is the which is the clear icon of the tribe of Judah. If you go back to Genesis 49 when um, Jacob blessed his sons, he says Judah is a lion's whelp. And the scepter Can shall I not... Can interject real quick? Yeah. Sorry. The arrow, the first thing I thought of that we think of in the United States is Native Americans. Again, evidence of the Israelites. Yeah. The arrows being tied to the Ark and the Covenant. So I don't know if people understand where that arrow comes from. <laughs> Good. Yeah, good. Go ahead. There really are a whole bunch of symbols on that coat of arms and on um, that crest. Anyway, back to Genesis 49, it says, um, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, meaning Judah will always rule and reign on this earth as long as it stands. And so we have that. With, with, the, infil with the blood of Israelites going to Britain and, and Spain and other places, we literally have Judah's blood in those places. Even though we have Rothschilds and others who are um, Obscuring. ruling in England now. Yeah. Right? Those those are not the people we're talking about, you guys. Right. 
Right. Well, Julie just mentioned this other time period, another mythological time period. If you ask anybody, they'll say, I don't really know if it's probably just, you know, mythology, British folklore. Um, I know for certainty that it was real and that the characters that are mentioned, most of which are real, there has been a lot of romanticism of that time period, and there are books on this, but the but Merlin and Arthur and Guinevere and and some of the others are real characters. They, um, right. as I understand, were were descendants of Joseph of Arimathea, and of the which which I'm considering sort of the royal bloodline of da of David. But they were descendants of Mary Magdalene and Jesus Christ, which I consider the holy or the sacred bloodline. So they had royal blood and and um, holy holy blood. I, Thank I don't... you. So again, from my book of life, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, I do know who King Arthur was and is. I do know who Guinevere was and is. I don't have permission to disclose that. I will just let you know that they play a role even now. And in the wrap, wrapping up scenes will play a significant role. Yeah. Um, the doctrines that they understood then with the Knights of the Round Table are things that have, um, some of which were revealed to Joseph Smith, or they were revealed to Joseph Smith. He did not actually reveal them to everyone of what he understood, but they will be. And Joseph Smith, again, in the wrapping up scenes with the Church of the Firstborn, will work with the Savior and John the Beloved and others to um, bring about the church of the firstborn and we will see these patterns that were then being repeated again the energy follows people the again it ties into sacred geometry it ties into tapestry it, it ties into roles on a spiritual significance and then the, uh, manifesting this in this physical realm and and what happened then with um betrayals uh, with some of the knights that led to carnage and death and some other things were significant and foreseen and even necessary for the plan to roll forward now I'm not going to go into that other than to say if you have questions about that ask the Lord and don't believe the crap you read on the internet or in the books with English lit on any of this King Arthur stuff Guinevere did not have an affair she did not cheat she was married King Arthur did not cheat those are all lies trying to taint the reputations of these light spirits same with um, Lancelot and all that there's there's more lies told than any truth that was actually preserved and again that ties into those that were seeking to destroy their reputations and trying to distort to keep from having truth be exposed about what was really going on in the planet and how they were tied to Avalon and some other spirit realms um, related to exaltation, higher doctrines related to marriage and stuff like that yeah yeah um, but it all ties in. It all ties in. There, there are other parts of that time period that are significant. We may talk more about Merlin was a real figure. He wasn't the magician exactly that he's been painted out to be, but was more of a high priest type figure and was uh, faithful yeah. and exercised faith and righteousness. And so the miracles or the magic can really be attributed to faith and miracles. Um, his his own birth. Yeah, I actually see him. His sorry, his energy looks different. He doesn't look completely mortal when I look at him. He, uh, I, I can't go into why this is, but just know when I look at his energy, uh, then it it is more of a translucent look. It has a finer matter to it. It's a higher vibration, and there's reasons for that that have to do with very deep doctrines that I don't have permission to go into. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So um, I was going to say that his birth has miracles associated with it, as well as um, King Arthur's. And so there's interesting things there that will come out more. Later on, as British history progressed... What, see, when I first started researching the British history stuff, that was like a year or two ago, and, and I didn't know anything about Britain. I served my mission in South Africa, and so I have ties to the British Commonwealth and um, the culture and things, but not exactly in Britain. So there, there was no reason for me to research this. I'm just saying the spirit totally moved it and orchestrated it. 
And there were there were things that I heard early on. Study folklore, British folklore. There's truth in all of it. I heard specific things like study Stonehenge, study St. Patrick, study leprechauns, study um, King Arthur and the Holy Grail. And and they said... People would really think I was just crazy if I said, guess what, guys, that stuff's real. A lot of it's real. Yeah. Elves and... I mean, not elves like we think of with Christmas elves and all that, but like uh, an elf civilization similar to what you see yeah. in Lord of the Rings. Like, like I can't even watch Lord of the Rings because it's got the dark version of so much truth in it that it like triggers me, triggers right. me, triggers me, you know? Right, it's Sorry. so fascinating. I'm rude. I'm rude, I'm rude, I keep cutting you off. No, no, it's it's cool. So there's just lots of things that I was led to study, that, and I've since come to see how they all fit in, and there, there's truth in all of it. There's lies in all of it, too. But um, Other figures, St. Patrick, we know about him. That's all true stories in there. And, of course, now in the context of this sacred or royal bloodlines, St. Patrick was part of this royal bloodline, um, even holy bloodline. St. Nicholas um, and others throughout British history. Other key players in British history usually tend to fall into that bloodline. Right. I'm, we, I'm ready to shift to the last part of this, Julie, unless you have anything you want to add to the British stuff. Um, let me see if there's anything else that they would like us to bring up. Uh, just going back to the betrayal, I just want you to know um, this is information that has been given um, through some records, but mostly through personal revelation and through memories I have from my book of life through the eyes of Guinevere and, um, and the emotion that has come as I have remembered and uh, have done energy sessions to clear up some of the lies that have been told to to generations upon generations. Um, the way it works with the energy work is you have um, uh, pre-mortal, prenatal, natal, preconception, conception, generational, and inherited and life energies that kind of captures every phase of existence for a mortal being or pre-mortal. And um, as I've done the energy work there and the veil opens and I can see some of these individuals who lived then and or are on the other side of the veil. Um, some are on this side of the veil, some are on the other side of the veil. I'd say most are on the other side of the veil that I see thousands and thousands of people, millions of people, because that was, uh, what year was that? I can't remember what year King Arthur was. In the 500s. Long, maybe. long time ago. Yeah. 500. So, long, long time ago, and all of these fables and myths and lies and stories have been taught in schools, in, like growing up in colleges and high schools, and they talk about Camelot and all this stuff, right? Mixed in with so much crap. And so you have these false beliefs that have gone on about what happened with the Knights of the Round Table. And, it, and again, that's tied into the Ark of the Covenant as well. Those, those knights were charged, and King Arthur was charged, with finding the relics and the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail is directly tied to Mary, Madel uh, Mary Magdalene and Christ and their wedding and the wedding cup that Christ gave Mary Magdalene when they were married. And that is tied directly into the relics that the knights were charged with, and King Arthur was charged with, with first locating and then protecting. And then at some point in time, they lost those when the kingdom fell and there was infiltration from the inside, and they were stolen. And then I'm not going to disclose where I know those are, but I know they're out there. And, um, and Mary Magdalene, when she went to the tomb was holding that cup. It is significant. And I say this to you guys because one day, when we are in New Jerusalem, some of you will be absolutely overjoyed when those relics are returned and they are maybe in the New Jerusalem temple on display or somewhere else. We will retrieve them. I don't know how and when, but um, they're being preserved somewhere right now. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, like, like with the Ark of the Covenant and the arrows and all that kind of stuff. So, my understand. I think one of those relics was a sword, and so we have the myth of the sword in the stone. I yes. believe there was a stone there as well yep. as one of those relics, and um, also the stone was actually a, a seer stone. Seer stone, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, also, yeah. one of those relics was a book of writings that I believe started with Joseph of Arimathea when they left, and so it will have the history of everything from Christ's crucifixion on to probably till about the time of King Arthur, yes. I'm guessing. My understanding yes, is... Yes, both Joseph of Arimathea... Sorry, go ahead. My understanding is those records have were preserved and in a British library somewhere, and I, you know, I suspect they're in the Vatican by now. Who knows? But anyway, right. So what what I've seen, what I remember is Joseph of Arimathea kept meticulous records, and Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene kept a handwritten record, um, and and so at some point in time, those records will come forth too. Yeah, cool. I mean, they, they've completely taken women out of the scripture yep. and any any kind of gifts they had or authority they had or priesthood power they had they've come these patriarchal um, domineering groups and Lucifer's behind it so is Cain have completely taken Mary Magdalene out of the scriptures tainted her reputation even gone so far as to make her out as a prostitute which is tied into to really really deep stuff that they try to distort and um, right along that you know, with some of the other um, women in history, with the Olympians and things that um, that people have worshipped, and so there's all a higher purpose in it. The Lord, through agency, he, he allows you know people their agency. But boy, does he have a plan, and it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. It is beautifully outlaid. I mean, like this is war, right? So what I do know, I'm not going to disclose. But I just got to tell you that the dark side has no idea what's coming to them they think they know but um they're not the only ones that can strategize mm -hmm. <laughs> and and i am so excited for the day when we um have a greater measure of peace on this earth and when people have their veils open and they can go wow now this sounds like a total understatement when you're talking about the lord and father but wow they're brilliant <laughs> yeah like like, they're so much smarter than we gave them credit for. Because we've got these people that, like, try to tell God what to do or try to limit him. And they try to say, like, God doesn't work that way. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? There's some amazing stuff coming. And, and even more records. Like, we have Mennonite records and Philippine rec records and all kinds of apocryphal records that have mixed truth. But when you put all those records together and it's all exposed and you get to the root of what's really going on, that's some real power in there. Knowledge is power, but there's there's not much you can do just with knowledge if you don't have light and you don't have purpose and you don't have the spirit with you. But when you put the, that all together, you're unstoppable. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I felt the need to say that. Uh, that's okay. Well, I think we only have a few more minutes here. Um, should we do this last section now and, and close it up? Yeah, let's do that. There's... We've talked about these branches of the original tree of Israel that were planted in the nethermost parts of the vineyard. We've, we've discussed Britain mostly to this point, but um, I want to just quickly touch on other parts of the world that we know of that have been touched and influenced by the tribes of Israel. Starting with Asia, there are several places in Asia that have traditions of this. Um, Julie, do you want to talk about your experience with the Chinese woman? We don't have a lot of time, but I don't know if I feel like it's worth mentioning. Yeah, in fact, I'd like to bring her in in greater detail on another podcast and talk about okay. what I see and have seen of the Israelites going into China and of the, the Europeans going in to China and Japan uh, related Christianity. My phone is shaking because my hand is prior to holding up. i got to figure out something to do with how to hold my phone when to do these. <laughs> because about, about 30 minutes in, my hand's like, Ugh. Well, you <laughs> so can, sorry for the shaking, guys. You can prop That's me needing to eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you can prop it I on your knee or your, your dash or your steering wheel or something. I can go on if you want to get comfortable for a minute. Well, let me, um, let me just talk for a second about this. Her name's Marie M Monson. That's what Eric's talking about. Um, 2000, I, don't, I think it was 2006, I had a series of dreams and some day visions, and I kept seeing, um, the Lord was teaching me and reminding me about the history of China and the Christian church um, in China. And I saw 
um, this young boy, a uh, young man, he was in his house in China, and he had been praying uh, for revelation, basically, and there were two men that came to his home, and they brought him a book, and it was the Bible, and that was officially the first Bible that was ever given to a Chinese man or woman, and um, he had to read it in secret because of the persecution and with the government what they did there. And then that developed into him talking to a few friends in secret, and it was very, very dangerous. Um, what I saw was that these two men were essentially like angelic or translated beings. They didn't look completely mortal, and they were messengers of God that came so that um, the Christian church could be started and, uh, in China and in the Orient. Um, because they had once had Christianity when Christ and others had been over there, and it had been squashed. Um, you know, it had it had been uh, everything that they had had been taken away from them. Um, fast forward that, and I, I was shown a dark haired woman. She had um, dark brown hair, not as dark as mine, with a slight wave. Um, I want to say maybe three inches below her shoulders. And she was single. She went over. She, um, the Lord called her. She said she felt called by God. She was Lutheran. And she lived in Norway. And she said that she was called to God to go to China and to preach the gospel in China so that the, the, the Chinese people could have the gospel of Christ. She ended up serving as a missionary for 30 years. She lived over there. And um, she did get married. Um, the, I do know this because I saw it in vision, and also because after I was shown this series of dreams that went on for several weeks, I went to the family history library, and I researched her, and someone had indexed her name, and her records were ready. I had to search, um, search them quite a bit, but I did find them. And then I was prompted to take her name, her parents' name, and her husband's name to the temple. And I had her work done and her husband's work done. I had them sealed together, uh, or sealed, I should say, and um, and sealed to her parents. And it was a beautiful experience for me and my husband. Um, to this day, it was one of my most sacred experiences in the temple. I felt her there and her gratitude, her acceptance, because she had labored all of her life in the service of Christ, but she had been waiting since she died in 1748 to be able to have her ordinances and move in to uh, Spirit Paradise. The way I knew that um, even what date she was born or any of that was because I saw it in night vision. I dreamed I would wake up and I would be sweating and crying because it was so emotional and it led up to um, this this Chinese man that I saw him at a cemetery in Norway and he and there was a, a priest there I believe that priest was Methodist it was a Methodist um, cemetery and the grass was tall it was like about a foot tall overgrown and they were looking for a woman's grave and it was a lost unmarked grave it, and it was made known to me that he was looking for Marie Monson and that she had come to him and had asked for him to find her grave. And so he did, out of obedience to the Spirit, he went and found her grave. And it was it was just this small stone, and all it said was 1748, and you couldn't even make out the name on it. It was buried in the soil, and it had receded into the soil, and it was he had to, to push the dirt off of it and everything. This was such an emotional experience for me to watch the sacrifice of these individuals in behalf of Christ. It was a monumental shift for me to realize the lengths that people have gone to serve our Lord and Master, to bring Christianity all over this world. And I'm just thankful for missionary work on both sides of the veil and for the work that she did. Because to this day, there are millions of people in China that otherwise would not have had the gospel of Christ. Those early Chinese Christians were so persecuted, murdered in cold blood, because of what they believed and because they would try to worship. And those Chinese soldiers and the government that came in and slaughtered them, um, the scenes are horrific, what I was shown. And I just want them to know if they hear me on the other side of the right now that I saw them, I see them, and I just want them to know that we love them, the Lord loves them, 
and that we're so thankful for their sacrifice. Thank you, Julie. Um, in the 1900s, the early 1900s, there was a priest that was exploring western parts of northwest China and um, in a town called Dan Huang. It's a it's a town that's along the Silk Road that what that goes from the far west Asia to over through um, to through China, and he was stumbling along. He cave, he found a cave. In this cave, there were stacks of scrolls. There were paintings and art, and um, they were they contained information about Christians and Christ. And the, these scrolls speak of Christ as the jade faced one. There were, um, they called these the Jesus Sutras, and um, I just find all this very interesting. I don't know very much more about where those records are today, but um, this comes from Glenn Kimball's research again, um, a record called The Chinese Library Cave, Ancient Christian Text Discovery. He published that in June 2007. There's... Um, Thanks. Yeah. Well, sir, can I say something? Yep, yep. So... So a lot of people say Christ can't come back because we we aren't into China. Well, we are in China, and the, the the gospel has to go throughout over the whole world. Guys, I'm here to tell you it's throughout the whole world. We have the internet, <laughs> and it's getting into these far out. I mean, Middle East and all these places. It is going, and and things are progressing and even back then they had the gospel and if they can send angelic beings to or transcendent beings or whatever they were to deliver a bible to a random young guy in his house who prayed for it i guarantee you they can send book of mormons <laughs> and anybody and any, any anything they need whether we can physically get into that country or not yeah yeah good point julie anyway i just wanted to say it because lucifer thinks he's like laughing right now thinking Oh, you know, you, you're telling your people that you have to get in, and you're not going to get in. No, the hang-up is not getting in on the on the physical realm into into these. I mean, we have the whole millennium to um, do the temple work, and so the, the work is moving forward, and we have not, nor will we be stopped with spreading this message of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go. That's okay. Thanks, Julie. There's there. Are... I'm on one today. <laughs> there are traditions of Christians in um, early India as well. In Cranganore, and there's there's an interesting tie there. If you read apocryphal records, Saint Thomas, the apostle, um, was believed to have gone over to India and did proselytizing there and sent some things in motion for Christianity there. There's um, a Japanese village called Harai, Harai Mura, and this this is a fascinating little village that has sh shrines that are different than other. Asian shrines they they are depicting well I don't know a lot about it I've heard from a, a friend we have in Japan and he's teaching us more and there's a book that we came across that's talking about some records and relics in this village and shrines that seem to indicate uh, Hebrew cult culture and traditions and customs and even some depictions of Christ and things on the in this place so more to come on that. I know that there's a book or something that's going to come forward here, hopefully in the near future. Right. Two, two more, real quick. Um, the Philippines is another place of ancient significance with regard to Christianity and Israelites. There is a book. I'm not. I don't have very much to say here at all. But a book is coming to our hands called the Ang Aklatan. That's A N G space A K L A T A N. Which and I've read it. It reads very similar to the Book of Mormon, but it's the people of the Philippines. There's a visit. There's a an accounting of Christ's visit to the Philippines in this book. And to me, to me, this and, book and, is absolutely. And he did visit the Philippines. Yeah. To, to, no, that's fine. To me, this book is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. I love reading it because it was translated by a person of low education and so there's typos everywhere and I love the typos I, every time I see a typo I'm like this this is simple and pure and it was translated by simple humble people so um, you can That's you cool. might you might be able to find that on the internet last of all of course we know about the Americas um, and branches of the original tree being planted in the Americas 
Um, what most people may not realize is there is another record called the Mentina Records, and these are more of a, it's, it would read like the Book of Mormon, but it's more from a Lamanite perspective, and it begins with the prophet Samuel. And um, to me, to me, it's a beautiful record, beautiful record, and it, and it sheds light in different perspectives. To me, in both these last records, my spirit burns, the spirit burns within me as I read them. Now, having said that, I know there's probably some things, maybe it wasn't translated in an inspired way. That's okay, you know? For people who carry the spirit with them and seek truth, it's just like the, the, the false parts just kind of flee off the page. It's, you know, it, it's like it doesn't even matter. You just cling to what's true. And so, to me, these records are, I would say, mostly true. They read like scripture, and I think they're beautiful. So I'm done, Julie. Back well, to you. And I've, I've read very, very little of those records. What you guys get from me are um, just the revelation I've had. I can, I can witness to you that those are um, records with a lot of truth in them, because that's what the Spirit has told me. I've probably only read 10 pages of, of the Metna and maybe five of the Philippine record, but I do know and have known for a long time that Christ visited the Philippines, and so it makes sense they would have a record as well, and that he visited several Native American people on this planet, not just the Nephites or the Lamanites, and so it makes sense that there would be other records that would come forth. Um, I, with that, I'm super excited to um, have what's coming on in the next couple of months. This reminded me when you talked about the Philippines. My son just got called to the Philippines for his mission. He leaves and reports um, to the Provo MC's MTC in December. And so we're excited for him to do that. My other son's coming home from California. And um, I have a little apprehension about the Philippines with what I see coming in the Pacific. But I love the Philippines. I, I love the people there. And I'm super excited that you know, we have missionaries there and, and my son being one of them. So it's awesome. um, Eric, do you have anything else you want to add? This has been a, a pretty intense podcast today. We do need to wrap it up. Uh, one really brief final thought with regard to those last two records. I think we're just accustomed to hearing the story of the boy who translated, you know, um, by proper authority and with seer stones and whatever he methods he used to translate those. I think we've heard that story so many times that we think that that's the only way true records can come forward. And I just I just know and feel in my heart the Lord saying, I can bring forth records any way I like. Don't limit me. Don't restrict me. I can use who I like, when I like, from where I like. That's the voice I, I feel right. from Heavenly Father. Uh, well, although I will say that there are some false messengers and false records yes. and fakers. Uh, many of you, if you have questions about some of those, I'm happy to let you know. Um, there's there's one in particular that's come forward in the last couple of years that I see from Brazil, and that's not legit. So there's some there's some false records that are come forth, but that's obvious. If we're going to have true records come forth, there's going to be false records, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. So, well said. Yeah. And um, same with true doctrines, right? Uh, you're going to have true groups of people that are inspired to do certain things. You're going to have the dark side that um, try to distract or, or destroy. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, Eric, yeah. thank you for today. Everyone, thanks for listening. We love you. We're thankful for you. And um, always love to get your emails. So just know that we, we get a lot of them so please don't take any offense if we don't reply just know that we do love to hear from you and we're thankful for your kind messages we'd like to wish you a happy happy weekend um, I think we're doing another podcast next week and it'll be our first one on multiple probations so how do you feel about that Eric? alright I'm pretty excited I'm not going to lie <laughs> he's, he's been asking me about doing that podcast for months months and months and months mm -hmm. so I think I think I'm ready. Yeah. yeah. I've been asking the spirit yeah, too. Thank you. Just we to love get you. I just... Huh? I've been asking the spirit too. That's been a big driver here. I wouldn't do it unless the spirit said it's time. So. Well, that's the thing. Eric's been asking me when I think it's time and he he didn't get the go ahead and I didn't get go ahead and then we got it and we confirmed with each other and it's nice it's nice to get that. That's really what we've been waiting for. Yeah. So thanks for uh clarifying that Eric yep, yep. <laughs> yeah that's, 
that's what Eric does. See, he, he gets these ideas on podcasts, and then he comes to me, and I get ideas, and we talk about it briefly, and, and then we wait till we get the yes. That's so, it. <laughs> um, I just want to express my love and gratitude to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to our Father, wait for a second and um, let some of the energy settle down the other side of the veil is, is I can feel a lot of energy right now so I just need to take a deep breath I want you to know wherever you are with us out of my voice that I'm grateful that I believe in this plan that it's an infinite eternal atonement and that Christ has suffered all for us and that by him and of him and through him the way can be made known and he is the way. There are no shortcuts. So with everything that we've shared today, take it to the Lord. Get your own confirmations. If you're not ready for it, you'll know. Just table it. Just just put it on a shelf. And when the time's right for you to get a greater understanding of whatever it is you're seeking, the Lord will make that known to you in due time. We love you. <laughs>